now, can you? Join me right now. Let's give him our best for the next few minutes, can we? I've got to praise. I've got to praise, and i got to get it out. Hallelujah. 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 I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him now, praise him now, praise him now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. The Bible says where two or three gather together in his name. So I want to make sure everyone knows we're gathered today under the banner of the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. We've gathered to praise him, to lift him up, to preach about him, to talk about his goodness, to talk about his salvation. Amen. Amen. I want you to greet your neighbor and tell him Jesus is the reason I'm here today. Jesus is the reason I'm here today. How many of you feel like you gave him your best praise today? How many of you feel like you could give him a little bit more right now? Just got a little bit more. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. To all of our guests today, we welcome you, and we're so thrilled that you're here, and we pray that you would consider First Pentecostal Church to be a place of refuge, a strong and mighty tower. To those that we haven't seen in a while, I see a few faces out there that are familiar. We welcome you back. We do believe in the power and the glory and the strength of this season. I am always, always joyful as we prepare for a new year and we're working towards that in a series that we're calling The Revivalist. I, I will be preaching the conclusion of that series, God willing, next week. I want to pause today just for a moment to talk about the preeminence of this season. And that is Emmanuel, God with us. As a child, I did not hear the word Advent that often. It was not a part of our Christmas vocabulary. A number of years ago, I did some reading about the word or the thought behind Emmanuel. I mean, I'm sorry, Advent. And I found it to be very striking, very important. It's important in the Church of England so we don't hold it to a religious value, but certainly a spiritual value, and that is to give pause, to reflect, and to prepare for the coming of Christ. Now, we know that he's already come. We celebrate it, and we know he's coming back. And his coming back is what we're preparing for. And Christmas is a measurement whereby we are reminded to pause and remember. He came once and many missed him. He's coming again. I have purposed in my heart not to miss him. Amen. Amen. Today's message I, I'm going to preach to you is engaged. It's invested. I preach it with much prayer and much fasting and fasting. Um, and I, I don't expect you to be overly invested immediately. I want you to think and consider, and it is a thinking message. And so we're going to work our way through it. I'm not going to be in a hurry. We're going to work our way through the revelation of who Jesus is. I delight, I joy in Jesus. He is my everything. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came to be. 
His mother was pledged Mary to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child. And the child that was within her, Jesus, was placed there by the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born. Born. And unto us a son is given. A child is born. Lord, bless our time in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. You may be seated. Didn't our praise and worship team do such a great job this morning? We have many life groups that kind of formed in, in, the, in the fullness of the season. But we want to celebrate a very productive season in wrap-up to our life groups for 2022. In fall of 2022, we had many receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and many that were baptized in Jesus' name as a product of Bible studies and life groups. And so we want to celebrate life groups. It's part of our DNA. The reason the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, use the word Father to describe God and because Jesus is named as a son, relates to one truth, and that is that Jesus is begotten. There is a beginning to his sonship and thus a beginning to the expression of the father. And that's this moment. A child is born. A son is given. It's why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas in that there is a moment on that night in Bethlehem in which the Savior of the world came forth from Mary. This was the beginning of the sonship, Jesus begotten. In terms of his purpose for salvation, <laughs> he has a commencement. And the use of the term father is to communicate and give relational perspective to the depth of God's conveyance of salvation. Why is this important? If Jesus were a person in the Godhead, it would be impossible for him to have a beginning. As deity, he could come, but he would have to come as a king, emerging, rising to the throne as a separate celestial person in the Trinity. But the Bible says very explicitly that he was born. He was born of the invisible God. Not only does God insist upon there being a beginning, but the assertion continues in that there is an ending to the sonship. This containment, this parentheses, held in time, means everything. It indicates that Jesus is a manifestation of God, not a separate person. For unlike an eternal person, a manifestation has a beginning and an end. It's not eternal. The purpose of salvation is not eternal. This is why Jesus can ascend to the right hand of God as the expression of Currently, not as a separate person, but as the priority now in this dispensation of grace that salvation is at hand. This is the embodiment of truth and grace for this moment. There will be a day in which the very last person to be saved will be saved. The last person to yield to the name of Jesus will go down into the waters of baptism. That individual will arise, and when they come up out of the water, they will lift their hands and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The sonship and the fatherhood will conclude in that moment, in that that will be the last person 
to be born again of water and of spirit. At that point, Jesus will present unto himself a bride in what is known as the rapture, and we shall forever be with him. And the conclusion of the sonship will emerge into the fullness of God. So that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he will be all in all. Meanwhile, you can be saved. Meanwhile, you can repent. Meanwhile, you can be convicted in your heart. Meanwhile, grace is still abundant. Meanwhile, mercy calls your name. Meanwhile, there is no power in the earth above or below that can keep you in the bondage of sin. For there is no name given among men. Come down from heaven whereby you can and will be saved. If you call upon his name, this is the day. If you call upon the name of Jesus, this is the moment whereby he will save you and he will save you to the uttermost. There is no sin that is more powerful than his name. There is no past more decorated in its fullness of destruction than the glory which is found in the name of Jesus. For there is no other name, and never will there be any other name than the name of Jesus. But pastor, couldn't Jesus as a second person become a child? Couldn't a second person by the miraculous works of God come forth from Mary? No. And even Jesus himself resists this possibility. When Nicodemus is confused in John 3 concerning what it means to be born again, Nicodemus asked, can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? Am I to somehow be stripped back down to mere essence and be placed back into my, my mother's canal and be brought forth again? And Jesus said, no, you're to be born again of water and of spirit. Not only was he speaking of the necessity of Nicodemus to have a spiritual birth, but he also was referencing the embodiment of his determination to save. He said, to become like you, Nicodemus, I had to come. And therefore, the Holy Spirit overshadowed my mother, Mary, and at the appointed time, her water broke and I was born. <laughs> now you must enter into the water as a demonstration of birth and be filled with the Spirit. This is a testament to God's passion to save. Because he took upon himself our nature that we might be begotten of his nature. But note, this does not mean that you become a second person. When you are born again, you do, do not become a second person. You just become more of the person that he meant for you to be when he fashioned you in your mother's womb. Before you were conceived, he ordained that you would be saved. And when you are born again, you don't become a second person. You just become the person that he has called you to be. Neither was a person in a trilogy required to become a second person. Rather, the invisible God became visible. How? Spirit overshadowed Mary. Her water broke. A child cried out in the night. Listen, this is the reversal of the gospel. For when you cry out and say, God, I realize my sin. I realize the depth of my despair. I understand there's no good in me. I cannot save myself when you cry out and are led to the waters of baptism and are buried in the waters of baptism. Then you become possible at that moment to hold and house the fullness of the wonder of God, the spirit of the eternal. And you lift your hands and begin to praise him who was and will be forevermore. And as you praise him, he fills you with his spirit, the power of the resurrection, the power that created the world. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you are filled in the fullness of what it means to be a child of God. But note, 
you do not become a second person. This is only temporary. Because a, a portion has only been given. Don't like who you are? Do your best to pray, fast, seek for the will of God. Study the word, press in, and still don't like who you are? Be encouraged. In this life, you only hold a percentage. But there's another day coming in which the trump shall sound. And Paul said this corruptible must put on the incorruptible. And this mortal immortality. And he said what will happen is the fullness of who we are will be manifest. Note, even in that instance, you will not become another person separate from who you are. The fullness of God working in you remains in who you are from now until you stand before him, perfected after his order, perfected after his calling in heaven. The way that transfers to us in regards to Jesus is he is not a second person, a third person, but he is the manifestation of God. Come to change us that his manifestation might break forth as a manifestation in us that we might be changed into his image, into his likeness. And the point remains, the birth of Jesus gives the beginning to this process and the awakening of the Father and the Son. I would hold that this is so important concerning all the truth regarding Jesus, it holds every answer. This birth at Christmas. Throughout all of his life, Jesus communicates and refers to the Father in prayer, in sourcing deep wisdom, in overcoming temptation, in countless other instances, Jesus prayed and refers to the Father. Why? Because his sonship in its nature was purposed to be minimized in the extent of any role outside of salvation. Imagine what it would have been like if Jesus had come and taken upon himself fully, wholly, the purpose of God in the earth. Imagine what would have been required of him. Every throne would have begged his interference. Every uprising, every war, every measure of famine would have demanded his attention. No, no, restraint was necessary. This is why he states in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. I've got one purpose, I've got one commission, and that is to connect humanity with the greater force of the eternal, almighty power of everlasting cause. I have not come to do anything else than to be the way, the truth, and the life unto salvation. He here is illustrating the singleness, the narrowness of his cause. I am guiding all to righteousness. There is no getting to the whole of who I am except you follow me as a Savior. I can be all things, but I must be a Savior. I can give revelation, understanding to all things, but I must be a Savior. Paul highlights this tapering of his cause in sonship when he wrote to Timothy and said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. He's come and could have been all things to all men, but he was only to be a savior to the world. 
To be a savior, he had to narrow down his glory. To be a savior, he had to narrow down his cause. The child, Jesus, came as the fullness of God to Bethlehem. The son and the father formed only to do one thing, to save a sin-sick world. In a kingdom of earthly domain, when the first son of a king is born, he is from the very beginning conditioned, educated, and exalted to be king. Everything is centered on bringing him at the appointed time to the throne that he might reign and give the kingdom its cause. But in the life of Jesus, it was just the opposite. He was the manifestation of the king of kings. All of heaven understood him as the superior one. And whereas in the earthly formation, there is a necessity of a child moving in that direction. For God, it was the work of him moving in our direction. The king was manifested, yet from his birth, he came not to demonstrate how that he might rise to dominion. For he came from dominion. But he taught us how to lower ourselves in humility, to give ourselves to servanthood, that we might understand him in the fullness of his glory at the cross. It's hard for us to understand this because it's just the opposite of our worldview. But that, that, that he who was above all became less to serve all. But this was the tone of his 33 and a half years upon this earth. It was not though, listen, without tremendous architect. It was not without painstaking design. It was not without every work of his accomplishment at Calvary being efforted through prophets, through the stories of men and women that reach all the way back to even that of Adam and Eve. For all of time was measured in his coming as a son. Salvation was the determination of Jesus and all of what he did held to the single-mindedness of this cause whereby we have the Son begotten. We see this in the workings of John who wrote in 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, why did he send his son? Why the sending? For one reason, but that the world through him might be saved. These verses sound simple, but the volume of counsel regarding God's plan and design to save is impossible to describe. It's impossible. This expression of redemption is so radical and far-reaching. It goes all the way back to when God made man. His aim of salvation was so precise that God, within the counsel of his own wisdom, considered his saving when he formed man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In that moment, who was God conferring with? He was talking to himself. He was counseling with the dispensation of grace to come. He was expressing his love to that figure of the cross. And from Golgotha's crown, he formed man. Meaning that he made man from the condition of redemption. He didn't make you to be perfect. He made you to be redeemed. And when he formed you, he formed you with redemption in his heart. He formed you standing from the perspective of Golgotha, we must remember that the Bible is not a book written concerning the history of man. Rather, it's a discourse written regarding the salvation of man from his sinful history. Therefore, the book that we love so much, the Bible, considers and counsels only the staggering weight of men's sin against the stupendous measure whereby God defines the work of redemption. 
in this context. It's easy for us to see how that God would write into the book the counseling of his redemptive design and the formation of his desire to restore us even from the beginning. And make no mistake about it, this would be the essence of who Jesus was. He would remain centered upon this approach. Though he understood all things, he was careful not to give himself to all things. There were many instances in which this is exaggerated. When they asked him, two sons, would you please, two brothers, would you please, Jesus, hold court between the two of us? The eternal king could have. He could have measured the weight of even that of the distance between Ishmael and Isaac. But he refused, testifying, I haven't come to set up court that I might give counsel to the things of men. I've come to die on a cross. When asked concerning the end of time and the the concourse whereby all things would come to an end, the eternal one had knowledge of such. But he said, I haven't come to give expression to that, but I've come because I must walk the Via Della Rosa and make my way to Calvary. When they desired for him to rise up and take dominion over over Rome and put Rome under his feet, he said, no, I'm only here materialized as the begotten of the eternal one that I might march forth and give power of and testimony of an empty grave. I'm only here that I might save all who call upon my name. Don't be confused about his relationship with the Father or instances in which he seems to be lacking domain or the vagueness of his kingly function. He's only here as the personification of God for the singleness of one thing, that he might save men from their sins. That's why Jesus said, it is said of him, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of him himself of no reputation. He took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found fastened in man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Why? Because he was begotten for one reason, and that is to save us from our sins. Oh, give him praise. Oh, give him praise. Oh, you people, give him praise. Oh, listen to this. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery. Key word is form. The word form comes from the meaning of mesra. That is defined as a shared division. It is used often and means placement to region. For example, Westlake and Lake Charles together would be considered as a shared division, that of the lake area. The further you move out on the map, the more you see shared divisions. The less you see of a specific dominion, the more you see of a general view. To consider God above all is to behold his indescribability. But as you zoom in, you behold the distinctions found in his oneness. Chief among them. What's the, what's the call to be a deliverer? It's impossible to over-exaggerize what it meant for him to be Savior of the world. The closer you zoom in to the Word of God, the more you see his desire and design to save written into every statement of the wonder of this shared division. Moraz also speaks to the intact of a body. It's what Paul used when he spoke of the glorification of the whole of the church. He said, the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Nor can the hand say to the feet, I have no use for you in 1 Corinthians. They are part of a whole, never meant to stand or exist apart. To separate them would be to cause some part of the body to not exist in full function. And this is what it meant for Jesus Christ to be begotten. He was of the whole, a portion of God, 
zeroed in for a certain amount of time. That he might save us from the detriment of our sin. It's impossible for you and I to understand this. But we are living, listen to me, we are living in a very concentrated portion of this separated division. We are living in an hour unlike any other hour. For the name of Jesus was not mentioned or uttered at any point in history save 2,020 years ago when the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. And all of a sudden, all of heaven zeroed in. All of heaven zeroed in. And God said, I'm about to save in a way that no dispensation has ever been able to understand. We're living right now in the concentrated salvation of Jesus Christ. I want to say thank you, Jesus, because I know my family can be saved. I'll I want to say thank you, Jesus, that I live in an hour in which you have gone after every tribe and every language, in which you have gone after every child, every son, every daughter, in which you have testified, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh. We would not think of plucking an eye out. We would not think of plucking an eye out or saying to our hand or foot, I have no need of you. Neither is there to be any separation between who God was and who he came to be, the Savior. One might question and say, but Galatians 4 and 4 reads, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. The word sent speaks of a mission. The idea is simple. At the birth of Jesus, God zoomed in on a central division of his grandeur and put forth the commandment, let's start the mission. Let's save to the uttermost. Paul, by the time of his writings in Colossians, has dealt with the resistance of the Judaizers to such a great extent. Their passion is to add to the gospel by bringing in some measure of legalism. All of that changes in his letter to the Colossians. A letter he wrote and authored on behalf of one man of whom loved them so much, Ephratus. Ephratus had said there's great tremendous misunderstanding in the church of the Colossia. Paul, you must contend with it. And Paul said, what is it? And he said, well, they are bound in their Gentile nature. And whereas others are adding legalism, they are adding hedonism. They are entangled in superstition and paganism. And Paul said, I will write. He'd never been there. But he said, I will write to them and give counsel to them. And he writes of one thing, and that is the duality of Jesus as man and God, and the effort is stupendous. And this is the underlining of his point. He writes and says to them plainly, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And then he puts pen to paper and tells us why Jesus is enough. For Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The word image translates to icon, meaning manifestation, meaning that God is fully revealed in Jesus, but understand what it conveys. God is invisible. And that doesn't mean that he merely cannot be seen, but it means he is unknowable. <laughs> you cannot know him. You cannot understand him. In the exaltation of Christ, though, the unknowable God <laughs> became defined. But there's more. According to Barclay, the ancient Jewish philosopher Philo equates the icon of God with the logos, the word of creation. Whew! This combination gives us the fullness of the phrase, the image of the invisible God. It means that the incomprehensible became viewable and knowable, which was the word incarnate. 
This is why John wrote and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here it is. And we beheld his glory. He said, we thought we knew who God was until he showed up. And the unknowable became knowable. And he became knowable by the word incarnate. And suddenly the manifestation of God in fullness came forth. And when he sat down to teach, they said, never has there been a man that has spoke like this man. Never has there been an authority that has given counsel like this man. Somebody shout amen. Amen. It's time for you to rise up and give God praise this morning. It's time for you to rise up and give God praise this morning. I'm going to pause right now while we bless his name. you understood what kind of power you got when you quote the name of Jesus. There's something in that math, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. When you say no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and you say it with the revelation of who Jesus is in your life, there's power in that name. But we got to take understanding and hold to what it means to know who Jesus is. This is why John said, you may be seated in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. John said, I couldn't even begin to tell you about his glory. We had no way of knowing his truth, his glory, until the word unknowable was manifested. How do we know the greats of history, Shakespeare, Einstein, Reagan, Isaac Newton, Mary Anning, Florence Nightingale, George Carver, and there's thousands and thousands more. How do we know them but by their works and their words and their equations, the discourse of their fame that gives the earnest and sincere passion of their heart? Prior to Jesus, we only knew the invisible God by a few equations and words gifted to only a select number. But then came out of nowhere a manifestation. The icon the countenance of the unknowable, the richness of him who we could not define, the Logos, and it came forth. He was so defined in earth shattering that his coming divided the calendar in half between A.D. and B.C. No other person is quoted more, thought of more, wrote to more, emulated more, prayed to more than Jesus. The unsearchable image became knowable since the angle Since the angle of the Old Testament was only merely by the prophetic, he satisfied 300 plus of them at his birth. No wonder the angels sang above the shepherds 2,020 years ago. And since that moment, he has reached the globe with his logos. Universally, no other name is more manifested, lean on, and trusted That one display of the incomprehensible word has withstood time and tyranny, falsehood and greed, armies and hierarchies and anarchies and the rise and the fall of errant churches, countless revolutions, including that of the information age. And at no point has the image of the invisible ever been threatened. Why? Paul states it best to Timothy. He said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Here's how another translation writes. The Christian life, Timothy, is held in great mystery. There's things that we don't understand. He said, but this one thing, Timothy, we do know. God was manifested in the flesh. The light shined on and darkness has been reeling ever since. Oh, how hell has fought this great revelation. How hell has mounted an attack over and over regarding who Jesus was and and the singleness of his coming. But oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, 
let us adore him. Paul, in using both of the, of the descriptions held in the firstborn, gives us understanding in a deep sense. Colossians 1 and 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Firstborn is described as either priority in time or supremacy in rank. Paul uses both of them, stating that before all creation, Jesus is, and he is of a supremely different rank than all of creation. Now, you might say, well, pastor, doesn't the attitude of the firstborn doesn't it indicate that Jesus is less than God? No, no, no. If you study the ancient rabbis, you will see that they call Yahweh himself the firstborn of the world, meaning that he is the essence, the cradle of life. Notwithstanding, in the coming of Jesus, it's different. The rabbis de dedicate the term firstborn to a messianic title. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God declares Jacob the firstborn even though he was born second. Meaning that God called him the firstborn after the order of redemption. Do you remember how Jacob wrestled with an angel? And he wrestled there and the angel said, let me go. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. <laughs> and he blessed him and he said to him, no longer are you called conniver. But now you're called Israel for you have Favor with God and man. This is the concept of redemption. And this is why in Exodus 4, Jacob is called the firstborn. This is what is stated concerning Jesus Christ. That he who had no knowable nature became known as the firstborn. The firstborn of what, pastor? Not just of creation, but the firstborn of redemption. The first to wrestle with death, hell, and the grave and come forth victorious. This is exalted in four declarations of him in the New Testament. Romans 8 and 29. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, think about what that means. The firstborn of many brethren. He said, I am going to be a brotherhood. For those of you that deem you cannot live this life and you think I cannot continue to fail and rise up again, it's, it's, it's disappointing beyond measure. It's shameful. He is the first begotten of redemption among many brethren. He's the firstborn of the church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail. He's the firstborn of the glory of redemption. And more importantly, and perhaps more consuming, he is the first begotten of the dead. Jesus came as a beacon of Exodus 4, not just as the first begotten of creation, but the first begotten of redemption. Paul captures this in a way that's hard to describe. I'm going to give it just a little bit of verbiage. But Paul said, let me share with you how massive this first begotten of redemption is. He came down from heaven. Ascended on a tree, went down to the grave and into hell. And there he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Captivity captive, that means and accounts for one thing, prisoners of war. He said, my God. He said, let me tell you about this man called Jesus. He said, not only did he come to give redemption to those that were living. He said, but while he was in hell, he went down and preached to those who died in faith, not having possibility of redemption. And they were captive. And he said, I am the first begotten of redemption. Come follow me out of your misery. And he led them who were captive, who died in faith. He led them to the greater quantity of what it means to be saved. He is the first begotten of redemption. <laughs> pastor, what does it mean though, pastor? It means, it means that everything that he wants and desires in all of the holy writ points to that which is our salvation. Unto us a child. Colossians 1 and 16, for by him 
for all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. I, I come to a, a close in just a few moments. There's no doubt that Jesus is the creation of the eternal being, but to understand him as the creator of all cre creation is hard for some people to exercise. To accept this, we must recognize that Jesus is not a created being after the order of man. He's not a created being after the order of man. Two people did not get together and form Jesus. I've already shared with how God in creation counseled with his own nature as a savior to form the manifestation of his redeeming image. It was from this personification that he gave a life to Adam and put his hands in the clay and formed Adam. Not just to hold the mystery of his strength and wonder, but also of his redeeming quality. After Adam, God never formed another man. Even after sin marred Adam, and him and Eve stood there trembling and weeping as God commanded, Eve, you shall be subject to your husband, and you shall be held in sorrow at birth, and Adam you shall contend with the thorn and thistle. Never again did God, though, even after the ark had rested, he called for Noah and his family to emerge, but he never created another human being again. Yet, Matthew 1 and 18 reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Jesus of Bethlehem is the only person ever begotten outside of the original creation. This is how he would be born outside of the blood of man, which carried all of those components of sin. The sperm is what gives forth the contents of blood, and it gives forth the measurement of sin. Thus David said, we're all formed and fashioned in sin and, and created and bound by the iniquity of our birth, except for Jesus, who was born outside of sin. Notwithstanding, not only was he born outside of sin, in that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, but he was also born outside of the creative order. This is how the creator of all things could be begotten of a woman. <laughs> Though he made her, she gave life to him. And observe how the first begotten of all creation came to be. He was placed in the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost. The spirit that moved upon the deep before the order of creation was manifested while all remained dark and void in Genesis chapter 1. That force put the fullness of God in the womb of a woman. And note, in doing so, he did not break the law of creation. The law of creation states that all should come after the order of the first creator. The, the first creative form, it should be after the order of that seed. But understand, Jesus was not formed after man. Man was formed after Jesus, for he was made in his image. Therefore, the Bible is correct when it reads that all things were created by him. This is why he said to his enemies, Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. He was outside of creative order, but manifested through creative order, that he might form and fashion all of creation under him. But not only that he might cause the wind and the wave to cease and break the bread to feed thousands, but also that he might redeem those who mattered most to him. Say, Pastor, why is this so important? It's important because when you raise your hands and say, I love you, Jesus, I want you to know what you're saying. When you look up and you see a star on top of a Christmas tree, I want you to understand 
what the star of Bethlehem means. We beheld the wonder and the glory. When you think about this earth and, and, it, and its creative formation and you think well past the earth, comets have vapor trails that last up to 10,000 miles long. Consider this. Comets shooting through the sky have vapor trails that follow them 10,000 10,000 miles long. You know what happens when they condense all that vapor down and put it in a bottle? It takes up less space than one cubic inch. Saturn's rings are 500,000 miles in, in circumference, but they're only about a foot thick. If the sun were the size of a beach ball and you put it up on top of the Empire State Building, the nearest group of stars would be as far away as Australia from the entire state building. The earth travels around the sun about eight times the speed of a bullet fired from the gun. There's more insects in one square mile of rural land than there are human beings upon the entire earth. A single human chromosome contains 20 billion bits of information if written into an ordinary book, in ordinary language, it would take 4,000 volumes. This is just a snapshot of the creation that lies within his hand. And yet, he put it all aside. All the foundations of the earth, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, they remain insignificant concerning his higher calling. For other foundations can no man lay that was laid, which is Christ Jesus. The tremendous and beautiful formation of his coming. It is impossible to describe I've pounded through it the best I can to the greatest degree of my ability. I've studied it to the greatest degree of my ability. And still I feel like I'm so far removed from it. I'm, I'm, I'm so limited and so lacking in words and lacking in strength to preach and lacking in, in language to communicate. All I can do is tell you there is no one like Jesus. There is no one like Jesus. And to understand the exercise whereby he came to save us, it's beyond staggering. It's impossible to describe. No wonder John said, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten. 1. For by him, Paul wrote, were all things created Heaven, earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created by him, and watch, and were created for him. Colossians 1 and 16. Abby, if you would, put, please put it on the screen. Colossians 1. I want to read it to you again, and I want to show you the last part of it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created. Heaven, earth, visible, invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Watch all things were created by him and and for him. When he was born in Bethlehem, 
on that night when taxation had caused his mom and dad to get there. Every room in Bethlehem was under his domain. Every home, every bed belonged to him. For all things were made for him. But they were all filled. They were all filled. He didn't rise up and send his angels out to find the best place that he might rest. When no room was found, a manger sufficed. When he walked upon the road, every tree bearing fruit was for him. The wind that moved among the trees moved for him. Every star in the sky shined for him. But he did not bother with them except that he might reach humanity. He only broke the bread to feed you. (laughs) he only turned the water into wine to take care of the wedding to suffice the need of a young bride he could have said to any one of his enemies give me your sandals give me your cloak He could have told Nicodemus on the night he came, Nicodemus, give me your seat at the council. And it would have been his. But that's not why he came. He narrowed down his perspective to one single focus. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Stand with Pastor. Herod Agrippa in Acts 12, grandson of Herod the Great, who was king when Jesus was born, but ordered the infants killed in Bethlehem. Herod Agrippa was power hungry. He was king of Judah, surrounding territories. He killed James the Apostle, and when he killed him, he saw it please the Jews, and so he proceeded to arrest Peter also. He was so hungry for power, hungry for the praise of men, and he appointed a certain time in which he was set forth this this statement of his glory that others might call upon him. The meeting was simple enough. He was the overseer of bread. And so the people of Tyre and Sidon came and they looked up to him and wanting bread, when they heard him speak, they thought to give him praise that it might satisfy their stomachs. So the people shouted the voice of God not of man immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave God not glory he died upon the throne he died upon the throne Jesus is long gone ascended unto heaven Commanding the throne now as Savior. Giving decree and honor to this moment. Jesus could have taken Herod's life or his father's life. But he wasn't worried 
about kings of the earth. He was worried about you and me. He was worried about us. Oh, come, let us adore him. Come, let us worship him. If you're here this morning and you want to know what's Christmas all about, it's all about salvation. It's all about redemption. It's all about him pledging to save you and giving himself to that degree in such a way that that you would never be able to deny his love. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved. And I don't know about you, but I want to be revived in that salvation. I want to be renewed in that salvation. I want to pause and wonder at whatever place I am in life right now. I want to wonder at his great cause of salvation. And so I say to you, old, young, man, woman, in bondage or free, come. Join me at this altar now. Come. Let's not take just a moment. Let's take a few moments now. As our praise team is prepared now to guide us into worship. Understand it has a moment. It has a season. The sonship will come to an end. It will be absorbed. The division concluded and wrapped up. At that point, his name will be praised forever and ever and ever for what he has done. But today, he's still saving. He's still saving. And I know you might feel like you're a long ways away. And I know the depth of your sin might seem pretty staggering. But maybe my message has given you just a little glimpse of what he will go through to get to you. So why don't you do just a little bit to get to him? Just do a little bit today to get to him. Join with me now and say, oh, Jesus, mighty to save. Oh, Jesus, glory and honor and power and dominion belong to you. Oh, Jesus, how I worship you. Jesus, how I praise you, how I lift up your name, and how I bless you. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, how I bless you, Jesus, how I praise you, Jesus, how I bless you, Jesus, how I praise you. I said, let the depth of his goodness, let the depth of his goodness rise up in your heart right now. Oh, I hear the cry of salvation. I hear the cry of redemption.
find somebody right now and encourage them in the name of Jesus. Just put your hand about them and say, I speak the name of Jesus over your life. I speak the name of Jesus over your life. I have this confidence today that God's about to visit us in a wonderful way. He's about to confirm his grace in our lives. He's about to confirm his joy in our lives today. Hallelujah. You can't preach about Jesus without something breaking loose in the house this morning. Hallelujah. I want you to begin to declare over your friend's life, I speak the name of Jesus. We don't have to speak anything else. You don't have to pray anything else. Just say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I declare over you today his goodness. I declare over you today his mercy. in your body today, I want you to lift your hands. I don't have much voice today left, but I want you to lift your hands. It's not going to be because of the authority of my voice today, but by the name of Jesus, I speak into our bloodstream His saving grace today. And I pray that God would move throughout our bodies right now with His redemptive power and bring health and healing to our bodies now. And we have this authority and we have this passion to do so by the Word of God. If you have financial struggles in your life, I want you to lift your hands right now. In the name of Jesus, you declared, God, that you would be our way. That if we sold into your kingdom, God, you would give us a harvest. That you would bless us. That we would not be the tail, but we would be the head. That you would move us today. And so we put our faith in the name of Jesus. We put our confidence in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray now today that you would bless us financially. And I pray today, God, that you would, by your saving power, go forth in the glory of your name. That, Jesus, you would save our children and our grandchildren, our aunts and our uncles, our moms and our dads that are not in this house today. We pray the name of Jesus into their dwelling, wherever they may be, Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus now. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
And now let's give him praise, can we? Shandalaboria Kahaye. Hallelujah. 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 battle's finished we cross over to our great reward there's only going to be one that we see the one who gave himself say pastor why do you baptize in the name of Jesus because there is no other name And when I baptize in the name of Jesus, I take upon myself the same formation that he did when he narrowed down his cause. Narrow it down to one word, Jesus. To not take upon myself as a pastor to not to not engage in that which was his passion to say no to countless other opportunities would be in there so if we're going to baptize you today it's going to be in the name of Jesus it's going to be in the name of Jesus And that name will do the work. Will do the work. The baptistry is ready. It's in good shape. The water's warm. It'd be a testament today, I think, to him working in your life if you're ready to be baptized. We will baptize you. I walked through Kid Zone building this morning in prayer, and I can tell you that. Our staff and our volunteers have done a wonderful job in welcoming you this evening. If you have children, grandchildren, it'll be worth the exercise to get them together and get here. It's going to be a wonderful night. Again, Summer, is she here? She slipped out. Summer, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock five o'clock. So I don't want anyone to be confused. I'm glad you told me I'd be here when it was done. (laughs) Five o'clock. Amen. Jesus, how I love you, Jesus. How I cling to you, Jesus. How I need you. Thank you for coming, Master, Savior. Thank you for coming, not just 2,000 years ago, but thank you for coming today, walking through these hearts and minds. Lord, be manifested in our life. Help this Christmas to be one of special intent. We 
pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. To all of our, to all of our group leader, our faith and life leaders, thank you for giving us a wonderful fall. God bless you. God bless you.